Shalom Church, and welcome to our celebration. I hope you are well and healthy and better than well having the joy of the Lord in your life. And I hope you have come with an expectant heart to hear from God and experience the presence of Christ, even at home. If you are new here, welcome. And let us know in what ways we can serve or pray for you. Connect with our prayer host at the end of the celebration. May you have a meaningful time with us today. Now, tell you what, if you don't have a regular church, you are welcome to join us. And you can start by first joining a cell group, a small group that meets every week, each week, you know, to encourage one another. This is a fourth sermon of the series, Jesus is Better, from the book of Hebrews. Last weekend, Pastor Key preached about how Jesus is better than Moses in relation to entering the promised land. Now, let's recap the context of this book. It was written to Hebrew Christians who were under pressure to return to their previous religion of Judaism. The writer reminded them that those under Judaism have not entered that rest yet because of unbelief. The reminder to us Christians today is that we can actually drift back to where we came from and fall short of God's best for our lives. Look to Jesus, learn from our past mistakes, and encourage one another to press on. So we come now to chapter 4 of Hebrews. So let's stand and read this passage together. And you can follow that on the screen. So why don't we stand and hold up our Bible? Are you ready? Together with me? One, two, go. This is my Bible. It is the Word of God. It informs my mind, inspires my heart, and instructs my behavior. So help me, God. And let's read the passage aloud together. Therefore, since the promise of entering His rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us, just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them, because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Now we who have believed and entered that rest, just as God has said, so I declared an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet these works have been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. On the seventh day, God rested from all his works. Verse 9. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest, so that no one will perish by following the example of this obedience. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come right now, Lord, and illumine our minds. Be our teacher, Lord, not only touch our mind, but Lord, inspire our hearts that we may learn, God, to love you more and serve you more. And all God's children say, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Now, verse 1 says, Therefore, since the promise of entering His rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. Now, I want you to note this phrase, entering his rest. Now, what is this rest that we will be miss if we fall short? Now, most of us are familiar with this story. The entire generation of about 600,000 men perished and did not enter the promised land. Only Joshua and Caleb went in. The Jews did not trust God to take them there despite witnessing many miracles in the journey out of Egypt to the Promised Land. You see, the Promised Land represented God's rest, a return to the Garden of Plenty, a land flowing with milk and honey, freedom from slavery and oppression they had suffered in Egypt. This rest is all about a very good life. Now, while the Moses generation did not enter the rest, we will think the next generation led by Joshua had entered the rest since they got into the promised land, right? But clearly in the following verses, not yet. They have not entered the rest. So here verse 1, it says, Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands. That means not yet. And then verses 8 and 9. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. That means not yet. We realize that this rest is not ab about just entering into a place physically, but the spiritual condition that accompanies it that brings about total rest. 
So here's the encouragement to the Jewish Christians and us as well. Why go backwards to something that will not give you rest? Jesus, who is better than Moses and even Joshua, will lead you into, into a true rest. Now, what kept them from entering this rest? And it is unbelief and also disobedience. It was a lack of faith. So tell you what, let's define faith. Now, many people tend to think that faith is intellectually agreeing to a set of belief or doctrines. But we know it is more than intellectual agreement. <laughs> Even the devil believes and trembles, the Bible says. Many people will tell you they believe in God, but it doesn't mean they trust God. You see, real faith takes us further into a trust relationship with God, trusting Him, relying on Him, and clinging on to Him. <laughs> this, this reminds me of my three boys uh, when they were toddlers. And one of those fun things that I used to do with them is to put them on a high place and then ask them to jump. And I promised to catch them. And, uh, you know, do you think they'll jump? Of course they will, because they trusted me and it was fun for them. But they would hesitate if others were to ask them to do the same thing. Now, what's the difference? You see, they know that I am their dad and they're willing to trust their lives to me. There was a story of this man walking on a pitch black night when he fell over the cliff. Now, on the way down, he managed to grab hold of a small tree sprouting out from the side. And desperately, he called out for help. And the voice answered, what do you want? And this man shouted, I'm stuck down here holding on to a tree. I can't hold on much longer. Can you help me? Yes, came the reply. Who are you? The man cried out. The reply said, I'm God. What do you want me to do? Asked the man. The voice said, let go of the tree. For a while, there was silence. Then the man called out again. Is there anyone else up there? Now, we may smile at this story, but I think we are often like that. Faith is about trust, and trust in God leads to rest. You see, the word rest is mentioned 13 times in Hebrews, twice in chapter 3, and 11 times in chapter 4. Now, what is this rest? Now, in our, con in our context today, rest is an elusive word. The whole world seeks after it. If you were to ask people today, now try this, how's life? How's life? Now, what is the most common reply you will hear? <laughs> they will say, very stressed. Stress, la. You see, case in point is that many of us are working from home in this pandemic. And it has, in fact, saved us much time in traveling, right, for example. But it creates other problems. We may be doing less physically, but we feel restless after a while. Now, this is a different kind of stress altogether. We have this illusion that ceasing from work or stop working will result in rest. But God wants to teach us that it is not just about resting from work, but, listen to this, working from rest, that is the key. And let me repeat that. It is not just about resting from work, but working from rest. Now, some of the most productive and hardworking Christians I know of operates from a place of deep rest. They are never in a hurry, and they know exactly what they need to do. So how do we find this rest? Do you need it? So here's the big idea. Rest is found only in the person of Jesus. Let me repeat that. Rest is found only in the person of Jesus. You see, there are two aspects of rest. The first is that rest from outward activity. Now, this is a rest from, uh, in a physical body. And number two is rest from inward anxieties or worries. And this is the rest in the soul. You see, you rest from working and you rest from worrying. Now, these two aspects of rest is like two sides of the same coin. If a coin has only one side, which is blank, and due to some error in minting, this coin is worthless because it cannot be used. It needs the two sides to be minted to be useful. <laughs> if you go on an overseas beach resort ho uh, holiday, 
relaxing at the beach, but you're always, always thinking about your work, your business, your next projects. You know, would you really be resting? You have rested from outward activity, but tell you what, not from inward anxieties. <laughs> Some of us, after a holiday, need another holiday to rest from that holiday. Because like all good Malaysians, we attempted to visit 10 countries in nine days. We seem to be addicted to business, even in our vacation. So to take a rest, it's not just about ceasing from physical work, but to find rest in our soul as well. Doing nothing does not necessarily translate to rest in the soul either. In fact, for some of us, doing nothing results in boredom. Before the pandemic, you were doing more, but tell you what, you feel empty. But by doing less now, you are also feeling empty. So what's the problem? What's the problem? Tell you what, the soul is the problem. The gospel is a good news of rest for the soul. So let me explain this powerful truth of rest from Hebrews chapter 4 to help you not to miss out on this. So let's jump in. First, let's look at creation rest. Rest that is promised. Although the Jews did not receive it, it is something that was promised. It is the same kind of rest that God enjoyed when he finished the work of creation. So here was God's Sabbath rest was spoken of in Genesis chapter 2 verse 2 or in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 4. It says the same thing as well of creation rest. And verse 4 says, For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. On the seventh day, God rested from all his works. God rested from all his works. And that's God's original design and intent. After the works of creation, we are to enjoy the rest that God has. Did God rest because he became very tired after creating the universe? Of course not. F.B. Mayer says this, What is meant by God resting? Surely not the rest of weariness. He fainted not, neither is weary. It was the rest of a finished work of divine complacency, of infinite satisfaction, of perfect content, a rest of satisfaction, not after exhaustion. This is a delightful rest. Epimeia. God created the world in six days and invited us on the seventh day to share in this rest with joy and delight. It is meant to be an eternal rest, which he called the Sabbath rest. Sabbath simply means God has done it. We just need to trust him and be dependent on him and enjoy the fruits of what he had done. And then we lost all this. We lost this rest when sin came into the world because Adam and Eve wanted to be independent from God and to do things their way. And then God sets in place his divine salvation plan that this rest is only possible through Christ. He reminded us through the fourth commandment, observe the Sabbath by keeping it holy. The Sabbath day was a foreshadow of what's to come. We lost it, but God is going to restore it back for us. Now from creation, we see Canaan as a land, as a glimpse of that rest. It is actually a rest for Israel after 40 years of wandering. Now, this land was meant to be a foreshadow again of what is to come. But the Jews missed out because of the disobedience, although it was promised to them. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 11 says, So I declare on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. So to the new Jewish Christians, they were reminded in verse 1, Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. Now, the English Standard Version used the word let us fear. NIV used the word let us be careful. You see, what the writer is saying, you lost that chance. Don't lose it again. Have a reverent fear of God. You know, using our Malaysian phrase, don't play play with God. Consider this seriously. Be mindful of your spiritual state and don't take God lightly. God says, I'm going to give you another chance. Now that's the creation rest and it is a promise from God for us. So how do we claim it? 
Should we look at now, secondly, Calvary rest, rest that is for today, or the believer's present rest in Christ. Now, two verses there, Hebrews uh, chapter uh, 4, verse 3, it says that now we who have believed enter that rest. Now we who have believed. Now, Hebrews 4, uh, verse 9 to 10, there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from His. So note verse 3, we who have believed. Who are these we who have believed? These are the followers of Christ, like you and me. The Sabbath rest is not about a day, but a person. We can only rest when we are in Christ. For example, often when we pray for peace, peace for our life in a situation, you know, we could be praying in the wrong way. You see, peace is not in the absence of worries. Yes, humanly, you do worry. Things are still going wrong. But really, peace at the end of the day is the presence of Christ. It is Christ in our storms. We should not only pray for more peace, actually, but that we give more of ourselves to Christ. You see, Jesus cannot give us more of his peace because he has already given it all to us. The problem is that we have not given ourselves fully to him. So the next time you pray for peace, don't just ask him to give peace to you, but rather ask, in what areas of my life have I not surrendered to Christ? All your anxieties and all your doubts. And Matthew 11 verse 28 says this, Come to me, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. You see, it is coming to Christ that you will receive rest. Because of Christ, you know, we rest from self-effort to become righteous. Every religion tells you to do more good works in order to increase your hope of being saved so that you can go to heaven and escape from hell. Friends, listen to this very carefully. Christ has done it all. Religion is restless, but a relationship with Christ is life-giving and restful. And Jesus corrected the Pharisees, if you remember, of their faulty understanding of Sabbath. Because Sabbath keeping had become so burdensome for the Jews. In fact, he said, the Sabbath was made for men, not men for Sabbath. It's actually meant for our good, not to be burdensome. And God wants us to experience, experience restedness on earth. And that restedness can only come through Christ. He wants to bless us. He wants us to enjoy life from our restedness in Him. And this Sabbath commandment was put in again as a foreshadow of something greater to come. From this rest in Christ, we can live in victory. And this is us as overcomers, our present rest in victory. And verse 11 says this, Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following the example of disobedience. Let us therefore make every effort. Now, make every effort is about doing our best. This is not about working hard to save yourself because Jesus has already done that for you, but to do our part to stay on course because there's a tendency for us to drift away. Don't take your salvation for granted. We need to be serious about God, reading and obeying His Word, about worship, about serving. You see, what God needs to do for you, He had already done it. But he will not do for you what is your responsibility to do as a disciple of Christ. You know, let me say lovingly, there are too many lazy and mediocre Christians around. And this is a good time for you to say to yourself now, pastor is not talking about me. He's not talking about me. And I hope, and I hope so. Now, we may ask ourselves, the Jews in Judaism never entered the rest. Now, what makes us think we can and will not fall short as given in this warning? So here's the good news. Jesus gives us the Holy Spirit to help us to be an overcomer. You know, Jesus himself said, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. He will teach you all things. He will guide you. He will help you. 
And that's why when we wake up in the morning, I encourage you to say, Good morning, Holy Spirit. It's a way of inviting the Holy Spirit to help you for the rest of this day. And it is a great prayer. It is when we are diligent about His Word, and when we read and meditate on it, the Holy Spirit manifests Christ's presence in our lives. Verse 12 says, For the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. You know, in my first sermon in this series of Hebrews, I was encouraging all of you to read the book of Hebrews for yourself, and I hope you have done that. Now, this sister diligently did that, and this is what she wrote to me. Let me quote. Just want to say thank you for encouraging us to read the book of Hebrews at one go. In fact, I decided to read it aloud, and it did take me about an hour. But tell you what, as I read it, tears kept streaming down because I'm reminded of this. We are just so loved. Unquote. Church, there's the power of God's word. And that is, if you ask me, entering the rest of God, the presence of Christ that assures us that we are deeply loved. And that's rest. So the first thing we note was creation rest that was promised. Secondly, Calvary rest that is for today. And the third is this, an amazing part of it is the consummating rest, rest that is for tomorrow. Verse 9 says, there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. You see, Canaan, the promised land, is a picture of rest. The Sabbath day was a picture of rest. This rest we now have is still not the final thing yet. Like the kingdom of God, it is here but not yet here. All these are foreshadows of what's to come. Heaven is a final, eternal rest. Now, before I move on, let me correct a misunderstanding of heaven. This phrase, heaven and earth, was wrongly taught in the church during the Middle Ages. It was a blending of some ancient Greek belief espoused by the philosopher Plato. It is as though there's a space that is God, and then another one that is physical, like earth, and this continued to, be, to remain separated forever. So in our minds, when a person dies, he goes to heaven and remains there, floating around in a spiritual form, playing the harp, and worshipping God forever and ever. And by the way, that's not what the Bible paints for us. Now, it is true that right now, there's a temporary place of rest, and Jesus called this paradise to, to the dying man next to him at the cross. Now, this is only a temporary resting place for all the saints who have gone home to Jesus in spirit. But that's not the end of the story because there's going to be an amazing eternal rest described in Revelation 21 and 22. Now, listen to this carefully. Our creator God will one day bring heaven and earth together in this great act of new creation, completing the original purpose of healing the entire cosmos of all the sins and curses. Then God will raise his people from the dead to share and steward over this rescued and renewed creation. Isn't that an amazing thought? Now, when you hear me say next time that we will be going to heaven, I meant not only the temporary paradise now, but to be in that heaven, that, that new creation of heaven and earth are now one where God will live amongst his people. Heaven is going to come down to the new earth where God's glory will be. And this, my friends, is what the Bible talks about as eternal rest. Now let's read from Revelation 21. Verse 1 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And verse 3, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and He will dwell with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. And He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, 
or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. Now, this is possible all because of Jesus. The point was not for us to go to heaven, but that the life of heaven will come down to the new earth. It will be literally heavenly joy and delight from food to health to life in our new bodies on the new earth. And that's why, listen to this, that's why evangelism is so important. That's why we are on a mission to tell people about this eternal rest. Don't miss it. You have only one chance while alive on earth. It is our life and death mission, plucking people from hell to heaven. Now, what's my challenge to you today? Verse 7, it says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Do not harden your hearts. Why today? Because tomorrow may never come. So do you trust him today? Do you trust him to make sense of your past, no matter what you have been through before? Do you trust him for the future and to eternity? Do you have restedness in your soul? Are you experiencing this rest God is talking about in all areas of your life? That's why I think of people who have gone home to be with the Lord in the last 16 months. Auntie Lo, Auntie Mary, younger kid from our Golden Club. My good friend and Australian pastor, Milton Lund. You know, our dear brother, Dato CQ, my daughter-in-law's father, Mr. Yu. Serene, my, my staff who died, you know, passed away for, because of a heart condition a year ago. And most recently, because of COVID-19, Pastor Ravi. You know, I can't list down everyone here, but there are also other beloved saints as well. Of course, we grieve because we miss them. I'll tell you what, we grieve with hope because they have gone to an eternal rest and we will see them someday. You know, I think of people who are suffering right now. A businessman brother in DUMC who at the verge of bankruptcy can say, this is the best thing that happened to him. Why? Because God has become so real in his problems and had rearranged his priorities. He's still in the storm, but he found rest. I think of my son Ian, 11 years ago, when he was 20 years old, suffering from cancer. He could tell me after he's gone through two operations, saying the same thing. It is the best thing that happened to me because I've learned that God is so tangible and real. I think of UMC members like Dr. Kuma, who volunteered himself to chase his lion in starting the quarantine center. And my good friend's brother, Sito, who volunteered to be in the cleaning team. And many others knowing the risk they will be facing. And I thank their wives for supporting them in doing this. And I think of countless DUMC cell group members going out there in the last 16 months at the risk of infection to help thousands in need. I think of our missionaries and other full-time Christian workers giving up what is comfortable and convenient to them and head, and head off to a lesser developed country or a lower paying job to bring hope to others. And so many others, why do they do what they do? I understand it is because they, are, they, they know what it means to enter God's rest. Now let me end with this passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18. And verse 16 says, Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Are you restless, my friends? Look to Jesus. The big idea again, rest is found only in the person of Jesus. Now, if you are not a Christian, or you may have backslided, you are certainly not here by chance, but by the divine appointment of God for your life. If you don't find this rest, I want to encourage you to invite this Jesus into your life. You simply need to accept what Jesus had done on the cross and begin this journey with Him. 
You can do that by simply having a posture in your heart that says, I need you, Jesus, in my life to have this rest. Now, if you want to do that as I end, will you follow me in this simple prayer uh, in your heart? It's a prayer of invitation to begin this journey with Jesus. So let us pray. Will you bow your heads right now if you desire to invite this Jesus? Now you say it together with me, together. Dear Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for letting things mess up my life, which you called sins. Sin is running my life without you. I confess these things to you. Teach me to repent from them. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins, so that my sins can be forgiven. Today, I receive your forgiveness and invite you to come into my life. I want to begin a journey of faith into eternal rest with you and make you the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Now, friends, if you have done that, if you have said a prayer, tell you what, can you click on that button that says raise hands on the chat screen or there's a QR code that appears now in front of the screen now take a photo of that now a form will pop up to you and we just want to get in touch with you uh, to help you in this journey that you said you want to embark on we will send you some materials maybe have someone you know have a chat with you uh, so that it help you understand what you have just done now if you have done that I want to congratulate you because now you're on the way to this rest that I have been talking about now for the rest of us all right. I want to pray a prayer over you. And I believe that if God has spoken to you something in your heart, that if there's unrest in your own heart, especially in this pandemic, you don't have the rest of Christ in you. I want you to just come honestly before God and just submit your life to Him all over again. And to say, Jesus, I need that rest. All right. So if you want to, you can stand up or you, you can be seated down as well. But as you do that, will you just raise your hands uh, to God? And I want to pray a prayer for you uh, so that we will be able to just you know, end this celebration here with a message of hope that we can carry with each of us. So can you do that right now? Just raise your hands to the Lord. Holy Spirit, please show to us the beauty and glory of this rest in our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that in you, not only can we find rest, but also to work from our restedness, showing our deep dependence on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Lord, I simply ask now, Will you please help everyone here in this room to be honest with themselves about where they are and how they need to trust in Jesus in the areas you have revealed to them about their worries and anxieties. My earnest prayer and desire is that every person here who hears would truly enter into that rest. Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Now I want you to hear the words of Jesus again. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So will you come to Jesus right now? Will you invite Him into different areas of your life? Just do that right now. And I believe that when you earnestly seek Him with your heart, He will answer your prayer. So Lord, from this restedness will come courage and commitment to the work of the kingdom. Will you please do it among us? And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of His Spirit be with us both now and evermore. And all God's children say, Amen, Amen, Amen. Thank you for joining us in this celebration and we hope to see you next weekend.